Hi everybody uh, at Shear. Thanks so much for, for tuning in. My name's Adam Pratt and I am the author of this magnificent, wonderful book toward Cherokee removal, which the University of Georgia Press published in the fall of 2020. Uh, so when I set out to write the book, what I really was looking to do was to investigate the state's role in Cherokee removal and to examine some of the ways that Georgia used violent coercion as a tactic uh, to compel the Cherokees to leave their ancestral homelands. And what I uncovered wasn't surprising because the state did rely upon a great degree of, of violence, uh, state-sanctioned violence, um, to encourage Cherokees to leave. In particular, they created a paramilitary unit called the Georgia Guard, which the book highlights, and obviously the process of removal itself in 1838 and 1839 relied heavily upon state militia and, and federal troops. Uh, what I didn't quite anticipate, though, when I started doing research was the ways in that state politics, partisanship, and to, to a certain degree, race played in the story. Uh, as as we know, the age of Jackson is characterized by this system in which white men are going to be more equal precisely because other people are deemed less equal. Uh, and as a result, the desire for native land simply intensified. Um, and so because of this new political dynamic, governors and presidents uh, who had once been insulated from the people uh, are now having to ask their, for their votes. So in Georgia, this desire for native land is heightened and intensified um, because the state has this really unique way of distributing land to its white citizens. Uh, it used a land lottery in which every white citizen had an equal chance of winning land that used to belong to, to native peoples. Um, but undermining uh, any sort of attempted land lottery for the remaining Cherokee land that the state of Georgia also claimed was the gold rush in 1829, the nation's first gold rush. And within the state political system, the debate about how to distribute this land came to a head in the gubernatorial election in 1831. On the one hand, you have a guy named Wilson Lumpkin and his faction that argued that land that potentially contained gold should be distributed in the same manner as, as the land lottery, meaning that anybody should have a chance. Uh, on the other hand, the incumbent, George R. Gilmer, argued that the state should own the gold mines and that they should use the proceeds to enact a robust system of uh, internal improvements. So better roads, bridges, tax cuts, free school for the state's poorest citizens, not infrastructure. Uh -huh. This argument obviously didn't win out. Um, Lumpkin's supporters made their case in a really interesting way. They, they argued that the state should attempt to, oh my God, that's my cat. <laughs> they should attempt to um, preserve the white man's chance through um, distribution of, of <laughs> gold mines to individual citizens. And so this idea of the white man's chance was really interesting to me. Uh, it became one of the thing, themes of the book. <laughs> and it essentially informed uh, how the state government operated in the lead up to removal. Aaron, you are seriously interrupting something. Um, but obviously the whole notion of the white man's chance completely ignored the fact that there were thousands of Cherokees living on land claimed by the state of Georgia and that their efforts at self-determination largely fell on deaf ears. 
So it was um, at times challenging to understand a lot of the experiences that Cherokees were, were facing uh, until I stumbled across this uh, set of primary sources called the 1842 Cherokee Claims Commission. Um, this was a commission established by the Treaty of New Echota that required the federal government to compensate individual Cherokees for the property that they lost during uh, removal. So what's remarkable and really enlightening about these, these documents uh, is that individual Cherokees talk about removal not as a event that happened in 1838, but this very long, lengthy period uh, that stretched back decades. Uh, and they recount their efforts to hold on to their land and neighbors trying to help their neighbors recover their property. So, you know, it's this constant struggle to deal with intruders and fortune hunters thieves and gangs, state militiamen and federal soldiers who use their status as U.S. citizens to take essentially whatever they pleased from the Cherokees and then to have state and federal laws protect them. So that is essentially uh, what my book highlights, and I would be more than, than, than grateful if you would... Uh, purchase it, obviously. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, as always, you can reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, my email is adam.pratt at scranton.edu. And there's my cat again. All right, y'all take care.